Across dozens of studies, one special technique has repeatedly shown extra muscle growth, often with less weight and less range of motion. It's not a fad and it's not hype. It's the science of length and partials. Let's look at the evidence and why this might be one of the simplest ways to unlock new muscle growth. We'll cover the research, some critiques, and then I'll tell you how to use length and partials for more gains. Let's start with the research. These past few years have seen a renaissance in the area of length and partial research. When we conducted our meta-analysis on the topic only a few years ago, there were only four studies comparing length and partials to a full range of motion. Now we have nine studies. Now I'll admit upfront that some of these are preprints, some of them are conference abstracts, and some of them I only know because I peer reviewed them for a journal. But I'll discuss the results in broad strokes. Ultimately, you can decide for yourself whether or not you see each individual study as worth considering. But I'll give you all studies that are available. First, we have a study on the leg press by Warkhausen and colleagues. They compared doing only 9 degree range of motion leg pressing to 90 degrees leg press range of motion. In this study, despite doing a tiny bit of range of motion in the length and partials group, they observed the same hypertrophy in the length and partials versus full range of motion condition. We also have a study by Pedrosa and colleagues where they compared four different conditions. One condition involved doing just lengthened partials on a leg extension. The other second condition doing shortened partials. The third condition doing full range of motion reps. And the fourth condition did both lengthened partials and shortened partials. Broadly speaking, the lengthened partial condition saw the best overall quad growth, observing either similar growth to a full range of motion at some sites or more growth compared to a full range of motion. Third, we have a study in the calves by Cassiano and colleagues. Once again, they compared doing full range of motion calf raises to doing shortened partials to doing lengthened partials. A full range of motion did beat performing shortened partials, but lengthened partials led to even more growth, around double the calf growth compared to using a full range of motion. Next, we have a conference abstract by Mayo and colleagues. While this is only a conference abstract, I'm fairly confident that this study will eventually get published. And the reason for that is simple. These authors have published several studies in the area already. In their study, they compared doing lengthened partials on the multi-hip machine compared to doing a full range of motion. They measured growth of all hamstring heads and the gluteus maximus using MRI. They found, yet again, double the growth using lengthened partials versus a full range of motion. This was true both for the hamstrings and for the glutes. Next, there's our study. In summer 2024, we compared doing lengthened partials to a full range of motion in a full program in the upper body in trained lifters. When measuring biceps and triceps growth over eight weeks, we observed no real differences between the two conditions. There's a whole video you can check out if you're interested in that study. Next, we have a controversial study by Godo and colleagues. The reason it's controversial is because the partials weren't strictly performed in only the stretched half of the movement. Indeed, the length and partial condition performed reps that are on average just slightly more lengthened than the full range of motion condition. So you could see the study as more of a full range of motion versus constant tension partials comparison. But because the average muscle length in the partial range of motion condition was longer than the full range of motion condition, I'll include it. In this study, they observed substantially more growth in the triceps when doing lengthened partials compared to a full range of motion. Next, we have a preprint by Hadris and colleagues. I was one of the peer reviewers for the study, so I know it's being published soon, but for the time being, it's only available as a preprint, just as a note. They compared doing length and partials versus a full range of motion on the machine preacher curl in trained participants. And in this study, they observed around 50% more bicep growth at two different sites when using length and partials. Next, we have a super large sample study by Schneider and colleagues. This is by far the biggest sample size in the length and partials versus full range of motion comparison. However, this study had a few limitations. First, they measured hypertrophy by arm circumference. Second, only some of the exercises in the program actually used length and partials or a full range of motion. Most of the exercises were identical in both groups, confounding the potential interpretation. Third, the program used was very low volume, and as such, neither of the groups actually observed that much hypertrophy. With those limitations in mind, this study did not find a difference between length and partials and a full range of motion, though the lack of difference might be attributed to the fact that neither group grew much. Finally, we have a study by McMahon and colleagues, which is still in peer review. And the reason I know this is because I'm one of the peer reviewers. This is their third study in the area, and yet again, they looked at quads. They compared length and partials to shortened partials to a full range of motion. However, unfortunately, they opted to equate intensity between groups by equating for force at the tendon, meaning the length and partials group used 55% of their full range of motion max, whereas the shortened partials and full range of motion groups used 80% of their max. And because neither group trained to failure, it's very likely that the shortened partials group and the full range of motion group on average trained closer to failure, which is a big confounder. However, in spite of this confounder, both full range of motion and length and partials beat out shortened partials. Length and partials in the full range of motion led to statistically similar gains. 
To summarize all of these studies, if you want a simple takeaway, depending on which studies you choose to include or not, conference abstracts, preprints, studies that are still in review, we have up to nine studies comparing lengthened partials to a full range of motion and measuring growth. That's over double what we had just a couple of years ago. Of those nine studies, five found more growth with lengthened partials compared to a full range of motion, whereas four found similar growth between a full range of motion and lengthened partials. In other words, it seems 50-50 as to whether you just get the same growth from doing lengthened partials or whether you actually get substantially more growth when doing lengthened partials. And mind you, we have even more research building a case for lengthened partials overall. It turns out that we have around 40 studies in total comparing a more shortened and a more lengthened form of training. I'm not going to dive into all 40 because we're actually in the process of finishing a meta-analysis on the topic. That meta-analysis will summarize all of these results in a quantitative fashion. And that will be out at some point in the next few months. But across these 40 studies, the same finding is extremely consistent. The length and form of training always beats or matches how much growth you see from the shortened form of training. We have around five studies comparing isometrics at long muscle lengths versus isometrics at short muscle lengths, and we consistently see more growth with isometrics at long muscle lengths. We have a few studies comparing the resistance challenge, making the exercise more challenging in lengthened position versus an exercise that is more challenging in a shortened position. And although there are confounders there because of different exercises being different, not just in resistance profile, we do generally see that more lengthened challenged exercises are beneficial for hypertrophy. As an example, Nordic hamstring curls being better for growth of the short head of the hamstrings compared to seated leg curls. Because the short head only inserts at the knee, muscle length should be similar between exercises, but the Nordic curl is harder in a stretch, and that seems to lead to more growth. We also have many individual exercise comparisons, the seated versus lying leg curl study, the overhead extension versus pushdown studies, the preacher versus incline curl studies, Nordic curl versus seated leg curl studies, to name a few. Consistently, these studies show that the more lengthened exercise beats out the more shortened exercise. We also have quite a few studies comparing partials of different muscle lengths, for instance, a lengthened partial versus a shortened partial, and very consistently, lengthened partials are superior to shortened partials. We also have studies comparing full range of motion versus shortened partials. Since a full range of motion involves a stretch, it is on average at long muscle lengths compared to shortened partials. And indeed, yet again, a full range of motion consistently beats or matches shortened partials. I can't hammer this enough. The effect of training at long muscle lengths seems consistent and fairly strong. It's consistent across a variety of comparisons, isometrics, partials for range of motion, different exercises, resistance challenge. If we had quite a few studies finding better gains when training at shorter muscle lengths, I might be more hesitant about recommending lengthened partials. But the truth is, we just don't. However, here's an important reality check. Is training in the stretch, or even including length and partials, as important as training hard, as in close to failure, or just with high volumes? No. But the thing about training in the stretch is that it really doesn't cost anything. It doesn't really take you much time. All it takes is picking the right exercises or just doing some partials. And it is a pretty impressive body of research by exercise science standards. You don't get 40 studies on a general topic very often. Since we have so many studies, and the findings are pretty consistent, why are so many people still not convinced? A quick shout out to today's sponsor, Creatine Gummies by Tasty Gains. If you've followed me for a while, you already know creatine is one of the few supplements that's actually proven to build muscle and improve performance. But let's be honest, remembering to take it every day, mixing powders or carrying tubs around gets old fast. That's where these come in. Tasty Gains creatine gummies make it ridiculously easy to stay consistent. Each gummy has a full gram of creatine monohydrate. They taste amazing and you can just throw a pack in your gym bag or your desk drawer. I've been using them for months, and the convenience alone has made me way more consistent. No shaker, no excuses. So if you want to make one of the best supplements even easier to take, check out Tasty Gains Creating Gummies using the link below, and thanks to them for sponsoring this video. The first two rebuttals are that the stretch only work either in beginners or only in certain muscles. And by and large, this boils down to a couple of assumptions that are made. The first assumption is that lengthened training benefits hypertrophy via serial sarcomerogenesis, aka adding sarcomeres in series. The second assumption baked in is usually that sarcomerogenesis only takes place for somewhere between two to six weeks usually. So if you train with a stretch for about two to six weeks, you get all the benefits and no more benefits after that. But here's the issue. Neither of those assumptions has much evidence behind it in humans. First, there's the assumption that the benefit of the stretch comes directly from serial sarcomerogenesis. And people aren't just making this one up. This one comes from evidence in animals dating back to the 1950s. When animals are stretched out for hours a day with super high intensities, we do observe serial sarcomerogenesis. Importantly though, that doesn't really resemble what you would do in the gym when emphasizing the stretch slightly. You're rarely actually fully stretching a given muscle out in the gym, you're not really spending that much time in the stretch, and you're rarely being exposed to extreme intensities like researchers were able to expose animals to in these protocols. So even rationally speaking, it is unlikely the adaptations there are the same as the ones you see in the gym when just doing length and partials. 
At the very least, the burden of proof lies on the people making the claim that the adaptations are the same. And here's the truth, we just don't have those studies. To date, we have a single study actually measuring serial sarcomerogenesis in humans. And that wasn't even in the context of comparing a more shortened and a more lengthened form of training. It was just in the context of general resistance training. And so whether or not training in a slightly more stretched position, as we see in these studies, is actually causing serial sarcomerogenesis is unproven. Could it turn out to be true? Absolutely. Is there strong evidence to support the case? Absolutely not. The second assumption, that it only lasts about two to six weeks and then you've capped out those adaptations, is also unproven. In the research, we often use fascicle length measurements as a proxy for serial sarcomerogenesis. And when it comes to fascicle length, we do see that in the first few weeks of training, you see pretty rapid improvements in fascicle length. However, that doesn't mean it stops after a few weeks. And in fact, there are several studies in very well-trained lifters where they still see improvements in fascicle length after several years of lifting. To give you an analogy, you might be lifting weights to gain muscle. In your first few months, you gain a lot of muscle. After a few years, it's not that you're not getting muscle at all anymore and you gained all your muscle in the first two to six weeks. You're still getting muscle, just at a slower pace. And that might very well be the same thing for fascicle length. It's also worth noting that fascicle length and serial sarcomere number are not identical. So again, a rather unproved assumption. The second rebuttal is that these improvements in hypertrophy aren't due to the stretch itself. They're simply because researchers are making participants train a muscle where it is stronger. And this stems from the theory of neuromechanical matching. The theory of neuromechanical matching proposes how motor units are recruited and in what order. The idea is that the nervous system preferentially recruits motor units that are well leveraged to accomplish the joint action. For example, at the bottom of a curl, maybe your biceps are better internally leveraged to produce elbow flexion torque. So, neuromechanical matching would posit that at the bottom of a bicep curl, you're preferentially targeting the biceps over the brachialis and brachioradialis, which have worse leverage. To understand this theory, we have to understand where it comes from. Nearly all of the research supporting this theory comes from gait muscles, aka walking, and inspiratory muscles, aka breathing, where we do see that certain muscles are recruited preferentially based on their internal and mechanical advantage. However, this does cause a pretty serious concern of generalizability. There are some key differences between breathing and walking and lifting weights to failure. For one, breathing and walking both involve extremely low intensities for extremely high reps. For two, you don't really walk to failure or breathe to failure. Whereas in the gym, your sets often last only 20 to 60 seconds and you are going to task failure. In these situations, it is much more likely that the body recruits all motor units and muscle fibers and muscle groups capable of accomplishing a joint action rather than picking and choosing only select ones. It's more of an all hands on deck situation rather than let's be efficient. Because ultimately, if you're getting pinned at the bottom of a squat, your body is incentivized to put all hands on deck. Proponents of the theory of neuromechanical matching in this context are claiming that it's neuromechanical matching at play versus the stretch itself. Personally, with 40 studies consistently finding more hypertrophy from the stretch, even in cases where the target muscle isn't better internally leveraged, I'm inclined to go with the stretch as being the more likely explanation. At least until we had evidence supporting that neuromechanical matching actually directly impacts hypertrophy in the gym. The next rebuttal is simply that this is a fad. People have gotten big for such a long time without really focusing on the stretch. And look, I am all for hating on fads, but the stretch isn't that. Instead of engaging in mental gymnastics to dismiss something we have reliable empirical findings for, why not? just take the results at face value. Because as I mentioned, we have consistent support for the stretch being beneficial. But with that being said, there are still some genuine issues we need to resolve before we can tell exactly what's going on. The first thing we really need is an up-to-date meta-analysis. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, we're currently in the process of finalizing that. The reason we need this is that the latest length and partials to four range of motion comparison from my meta-analysis was two years ago and only had four studies. Whereas now we have around nine studies. So we'll have a lot more confidence in our estimate of the overall effect size. We also need more research on resistance profiles. We do have a few studies, but these are usually confounded by other aspects of exercise selection. Like when you're comparing an incline curl to a preacher curl, you're also comparing an exercise that is back supported, has a bit more stability versus less stability, et cetera, et cetera. So while you're looking at the impact of resistance profile, the effect is also confounded by different variables. Another area of research we need more on is the extremes of the stretch. You see, most studies we have aren't really looking at the most stretched position of a given muscle group. Let me take the biceps as an example. A lengthened partial in these studies might be a 
partial in a relatively shoulder flex position. However, we know you can get a greater bicep stretch by having your shoulder behind you. And so even in these studies, the length and partial condition isn't training the biceps at its absolute longest muscle lengths. It's training it at relatively long muscle lengths. There are a few exceptions of studies where they did look at pretty long muscle lengths, but by and large, we know a lot more about the sort of middle of that muscle length spectrum rather than the extremes of the stretch. Another big one is that we need more research on the mechanisms. Why does this stretch cause more growth? To really establish this, we would need studies that directly compare a more shortened form of training and a more lengthened form of training to actually measure different mechanistic variables and try to figure out which one might be a play. Because ultimately, studies performed in animals with wildly different protocols don't necessarily generalize to what we do in the gym in the context of length and partials. And as much as it's been memed when Dr. Mike said it, we don't actually know what happens in the stretch. And anyone claiming to for sure know the mechanisms at play is being overconfident. But oftentimes, people would prefer a confident explanation rather than honestly admitting that we simply don't know yet. With all of that being said, with all of the research we have on the stretch now, around 40 studies in humans, at some point, it is my hope that people will just start adopting lengthened training for hypertrophy. There will always be critics for this stuff. But we also have to be real. If we have 40 studies on this topic, as researchers, it may be time to start accepting that the stretch is real, is beneficial for growth, and that we should start turning our attention to other topics that are actually lacking research. For example, bulking. We only currently have four studies on bulking, and yet comparatively, people are quick to say bulking works. With a stretch, we have 40 studies, and a very high degree of consistency. And so should we really be doing a 41st study on the stretch, or should we be doing a fifth study on the bulk? Should we really be spending our resources on a 41st study on the stretch? Or should we start researching things that have less research and accept that the research is pretty convincing on the stretch? Based on all of this research, I personally emphasize the stretch in a few ways in my training, and I recommend you do the same. First, length and partials. I always do them, on every movement, whenever practical, and I enjoy it. There are cases where it's not practical. For example, on some machines, I can wrap out the full stack with a 4 inch of motion, and I would need to do 15, 20, 30 reps of length and partials to get to failure, and I just don't enjoy that. Likewise, with pull-ups, for instance, I would need to load up weight belt quite heavily to be able to do length and partials and not do a million reps. Finally, if a movement just feels a lot better to me a certain way and I want to enjoy it, I might do it that way. But categorically, I try to do as many of my movements as length and partials as possible because I want to maximize growth. To do length and partials, I just do roughly half reps and try to standardize with landmarks or joint position. For certain machines, there's a feature of the machine you can stop the rep at and reset. For a lot of other movements like compound lower body movements, compound upper body movements, you can stop based on joint positions. For squats, leg press, etc., you can stop at around 90 degrees of knee flexion. For RDLs, I stop just past the knee. The same goes for rows. For dips and chest pressing, again, around 90 degrees of elbow flexion. Just aim for roughly half reps, standardize it, and don't worry too much. The main thing is likely simply training the target muscle at a longer average muscle length. When I hit failure with length and partials, I personally keep the set going until I genuinely can't move out of the stretch anymore. I hold the isometric at the end for a few seconds and end the set. The second technique I recommend is length and supersets, which is simply when you do partials past failure after your four inch of motion set. When you hit failure, just extend the set with some partials. I do this when I don't really feel like doing partials or there's not enough weight to simply do partials and not do an ungodly number of reps. I do these on pull-ups and dumbbell incline curls, for example. Just using a four inch of motion with no partials past failure tends to be my fallback option. I nearly never do this. Unless there's an exercise where I can't go past failure safely, like a free weight bench press with no spotter arms. Next, I recommend picking stretched exercises. That means two things. One, the exercise should put the target muscle groups under a deep stretch. And two, ideally, that deep stretch would be loaded heavily. So the stretch position would be more challenging than the shortened position. Another way I emphasize the stretch is via a few cues regarding tempo. First, I catch the stretch during the eccentric. This will mean producing more force in the stretch versus in the shortened position because you're decelerating the movement and producing more force in the stretch. Likewise, on the concentric phase of the lift, I will explode out of the bottom position. I'll briefly pause in the stretch to spend extra time there and I'll avoid pausing in the shortened position. As in all likelihood, we want to spend more time in the stretch position and less in the shortened position. To summarize this video, the evidence for length and partials is incredibly consistent, not just because we have around nine studies on length and partials versus a four range of motion themselves, but also because we have around 40 studies on the general principle of the stretch. And this body of research is pretty consistent. Length and partials aren't magic, but they are potentially free gains. You don't really need an extra time to do them, and you also don't need to overhaul your entire program. Just bias your program a bit more towards the stretch and gradually incorporate 
avoid more stretch bias techniques. And if you want the training process handled for you, that's exactly what MyAdapt is built for. MyAdapt designs fully science-based programs that automatically adjust your volume, intensity, and exercise selection based on your performance and recovery. It also picks exercises that emphasize the stretch and using length and partials with MyAdapt is seamless. Just log it as you usually would. It's like having evidence-based coaching built right into your phone using the same research I discuss in these videos. If you want to train smarter, make consistent progress, and finally see measurable results week to week, download MyAdapt using the link in the description and use code WOLF for a free two-week trial. If you prefer a more personal touch, I also offer one-to-one -one coaching, while I'll personally oversee your training, nutrition, and progress adjustments. You can book a call below. Spots are limited. And lastly, shout out to Rascal Apparel for supporting the channel. I wear their gear in almost every session. It's durable, comfortable, and actually looks good outside the gym too. Use code WOLF at checkout through the link below to support the channel and grab a discount. If you enjoyed the video, drop a like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments what topic you want broken down next. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in that next one.